we're uh, talking on this program each day about the meaning of life. Uh, that is, why are you here? What's the point of it? What's the meaning of it? Is there any purpose in it? And uh, over the past six months, we've tried to follow through intellectually some of the basic facts upon which we're founding our discussion. And we've come to the point where we're now discussing the personality and trying to make some sense of what your personality is and what my personality is and how they were meant to work originally by the supreme being that created us. And what we have said, of course, recently is that he made us like himself so that we could enjoy his friendship so that we could have a personal relationship with him. And that's why we're here actually on earth. And that's why he gave us his own capabilities and capacities. So we actually have the same capacities as he has. Uh, he gave us three levels of uh, existence. It's not that we can be divided up into three parts, but we operate on three levels. Uh, the spirit and the soul and the body. And the body is pretty obvious. Uh, we know what that is. It's the physical uh, being that uh, enables us via the five senses to be conscious of the world around us, of circumstances and of people and of things. The soul is the psychological part of us that is the self-conscious part of us. And the spirit is the part of us that is able to contact God himself. And that is because he himself, the very essence of the creator of the universe, is spirit. Now, if you say, well, I mean, what do you mean by my spirit? Well, the spirit of a man, the spirit of Churchill. You talk about the spirit of Churchill, you talk about his indomitable spirit, you talk about his uh, courageous spirit. It's the very essence of the man. If you say, oh, what spirit he has, you mean the oomph, the what makes him him. Uh, if you regard yourself, it's you. It's the very essence of you. It's not your mind, not your emotions, not your will, which you share with everybody else, though they are gradually formed through habit differently to everyone else, yet they are, in a way, neutral equipment. Your body, which in a way you vary just a little from everybody else's body, but your spirit is the real you. It's the very heart of you. Uh, one of the classical writers, you remember, said, what a man is when he's alone, that he is, and nothing else. Now, that's the you. So your spirit is you yourself, the very heart of you. When you're alone and quiet, and you're not being provoked or stimulated or motivated by anybody else or by any circumstances or any needs that you have, that is you, your spirit. It's the very heart of you. It's you yourself. And, uh, of course, you're dead right if you say, ah, oh, I don't know who I am. I have no idea what my spirit... You're dead right. Because most of us have spirits that are now pretty dead. I mean, most of us have become little robots and little automatons that uh, operate simply by physical stimulus or by, at times, uh, sometimes the higher animals among us operate by uh, emotional stimulus and uh, some few of us, like Einstein, operate by intellectual stimulus, but most of us have spirits that are pretty dead. And so you're dead right. Uh, many of us are bewildered. Uh, we can't find ourselves. I mean, we talk about it in that uh, way. We say, oh, that person has never found himself. Or we talk about ourselves and say, I have to find myself. And unfortunately, of course, as the years go by and we be we are dominated by either the needs of our body or the needs of our job, 
for the needs of our relatives or our mothers, our fathers, or our children, or our wives, or our husbands. We become just little need meters, and we cease to know who we are, or what we are, or what we really ought to be. So I don't blame you in saying, well, I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about my spirit. I think most of us have great difficulty uh, having any idea that we have a spirit, but it is true that you have a spirit. If you say, well, I mean, why should I believe it? Well, there is a, a, there are many verses, uh, many parts of that old book called the Bible that r refer to man's spirit. But uh, there's one in a book, if you ever want to look it up, it's in the New Testament. It's a book called Corinthians, and in 1 Corinthians, and verse... Uh, chapter 2 and verse 11, it runs like this, For what person knows a man's thoughts except the spirit of the man which is in him? And so every man has a spirit. Every woman has a spirit. That uh, separates you from the animals. The animals don't have spirits, but you have a spirit that is actually the only part of you that can communicate with God. Your spirit is the real you. It is true that for most of us, it has died or has become comatose, has gone to sleep years ago. But your spirit is there. And, of course, that's the part of you that is able to commune with God. That's because, in fact, he himself is a spirit. There's another part of the Bible that happens to say God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, or they that commune with him must commune with him in spirit and in truth. And actually, that is one of the functions of your spirit. It can actually commune with God, uh, commune in the sense of converse with him, or communicate, or uh, interact with him. It's your spirit that has the capacity to interact with God or communicate with God. You can know God directly through your spirit. There happens to be another verse in the Bible. It's in Romans 8 and verse 16, and it says, The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit. So God has a spirit, and you have a spirit, and that bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the way you know God is actually through your spirit. I'm not surprised at all that you think to yourself, oh, well, that's far beyond me, because in fact, most of us have spirits that are dead to God and uh, that uh, we're not conscious of at all. But it is in your spirit that you commune with God. Now, of course, if you say, well, I mean, how will I ever do that? Well, that's what we'll be talking about in future months, how you commune with God. But maybe it would be helpful to say one of the basic factors in exercising your spirit is to really want to get through to God. It's the real you wanting and desiring. It's not words that you speak. It's not feelings that you have. It's not some kind of practice of transcendental meditation or of cosmic consciousness. It's not even necessarily going to church or singing hymns or even reading the Bible. It's a strong desire inside you to get to the person who is at the heart of the universe and who made and created you. Um, Jesus put it like this. He said, uh, you're happy if you hunger and thirst after God. And uh, if you want to find God, you must seek him with all your heart. So it's a strong desire, a strong wanting. That's maybe the best way to put it to people like ourselves who are at the very beginning of trying to understand what our spirit is. So if you're listening to this in the car or at home and you're thinking, oh, the guy has already left me miles behind, accept this, that your spirit is you, the real you. And if you get down, well, you don't even need to get down your knees. Maybe you just need to sit in the car there and put her in neutral and want God with all your being. That begins to get down nearer your spirit. 
Uh, in other words, it doesn't matter what you're thinking, it doesn't matter what you're feeling, but if you desire God with all your being, that often brings your spirit into some kind of activity. That's why many of us feel we were nearest God when we were in some kind of crisis situation, because there we sank into our real selves at last. We had to put off all our pretenses and all our uh, big show, and we had to be ourselves. And often that was the time when we were nearest to God. So our spirit is the part of us that communes with God. Let's talk a little more about that.